font tout au... summit can help ensure that artificial intelligence charts a course that benefits humanity and bolsters our shared values. Welcome to AI for Good the leading action-oriented, global and inclusive United Nations platform on AI. Organized by ITU, in partnership with 40 UN sister organizations, and co-convened with Switzerland. The goal of AI for Good is to identify practical applications of AI to advance the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and scale those solutions for global impact. In today's session, we're counting on you to use the live video wall feature to ask questions and post comments to help create an engaging discussion. We encourage you to stay until the end to chat, connect, ask questions, and network with our distinguished panelists and world-class AI experts in the neural network. It is now time to kick off the session and welcome our first speaker. The floor is yours. Welcome everyone. Uh to our AI for Climate Science series. Uh, we're really excited to be back after break and we will now host sessions every two weeks into late May or even longer. And we alternate these sessions now with a more Earth System Science focused series. So there's something on every week that you might find interesting. So join us for many uh, exciting speakers every week. And one of them is of course here today. So we're kicking off with Mike Pritchard. Mike is a professor of Earth System Science at the University of California, Irvine, and he's been a pioneer in applications of machine learning to small-scale climate processes, in particular clouds. And more recently, Mike has joined NVIDIA as a director of climate simulation, or climate simulation research, and with a vision really to transform climate modeling through data-driven machine learning methods. And we're also very much looking forward to learn more about the science behind this today. But without further delay, I will now hand over to Mike for his talk, Escalating Adventures in Using Machine Learning. And I think there's a longer subtitle as well. Over to you, Mike. Thank you so much. So let me dive right in. It's a real pleasure to be here. Now here's the roadmap. I'd like to discuss my history using multi-scale methods for machine learning parameterization, some current frontiers, um, some topics about low clouds, and then I'll conclude with my new perspectives uh, through this NVIDIA position. Um, but I want to mention on my academic side, I've been a university professor for a decade. I have two interests, global climate dynamics, they're beautiful, and what's going to happen to my kids in the future. On the climate dynamic side, I'm interested in how clouds might reorganize in the future, um, how rain bands that are sculpted by energetic constraints at our planet at our planetary boundary um, may, may change as the climate warms due to fundamental reasons. Uh, on the impact side, I'm interested in the fate of rainforests and tropical cyclones and uh, my future kids' experience of the water cycle in a changing planet. And I find these interests tend to coincide on the issue of turbulence. And confronting turbulence with computers, we live in a turbulent boundary layer, and the lack of explicit sub-kilometer turbulence in today's climate models is something I think should keep us up at night. And I especially think about this problem as someone who lives in Southern California, right next to this beautiful sheet of clouds. It's a stratocumulus deck, a marine stratocumulus deck. You can see it from the beach as a thin layer of cloud on the horizon, but it's really the edge of a, a planetary 
scale sheet of clouds that reflects solar radiation from the planet. <clears throat> Whether it will dissipate as the planet warms like ice sheets, exposing darker surfaces and causing more climate hazard or thicken up and buffer the, the climate experiment is a multi-trillion dollar question that's still unresolved. And it's a huge computational challenge. So <clears throat> on the left, you can see a deep cumulonimbus nimbalist cloud. It's uh, the, the most ambitious high resolution climate models today, global storm resolving models have just begun to be able to capture the mixing of these physics, the largest storm systems on the planet. The grid requirements there are about a horizontal uh, resolution of about a kilometer. But shallow clouds like the ones I live next to are much harder to simulate. They require tens, of, tens to hundreds of times more grid resolution, and therefore much finer time steps. And it's just tens of thousands of times more computationally expensive than seems possible today. But but lack of these physics and climate models should keep us up at night. We, we live in a turbulent boundary layer. I mentioned these low clouds. Fate will affect our fate. And meanwhile, those who think about the planetary dynamics know that the fine scale de details of mixing between the turbulent boundary layer and the pre troposphere affect global circulations that constrain rain, rain bands and watershed properties. <clears throat> and here's just a snapshot of the computational challenge on a log scale here. Um, here we are uh, about today. In 2020, we can 2023, we can simulate the planet operationally at 25 kilometer resolution and 10 meter time steps. Um, that's what's done for governmental assessments routinely. Uh, looking out to the, the bleeding edge technology is that much higher computational intensity, kilometer resolution, those deep clouds. But what, what will it take to get to the shallow clouds I really care about? It seems just completely out of reach, you know, until 2060 or so, assuming Moore's law keeps chugging along, and by then the climate's already changed. So how do we cope with this problem? In academia, I've liked to use this method, which is called a multi-scale modeling framework. It's a way of cheating. Um, instead of covering the whole planet with the resolution you think it deserves, you limit that resolution to small patches of atmosphere separated from each other. Um, and so we make some idealizations like limiting the high resolution physics to two dimensions to save compute and assuming lateral periodicity so that the calculations are very parallel scalable and we can do efficient calculations without a lot of communication barrier. But the point is that it's a way to sidestep making assumptions about the details of these fine scale physics by allowing explicit eddies to emerge from appropriate governing equations. And um, it turns out this approach also affords convenient scale exchange arteries for machine learning. So I wanna begin the story here, which was my journey to AI, which was to take this multi-scale method of simulating the climate and ask whether we could um, use advances in deep learning, um, curve fitting on steroids, to essentially replace the inputs and outputs of a super parameterized climate model. And so here are the inputs, you can imagine will be things like the temperature profile, the vertical structure of temperature, the vertical structure of moisture from a host planetary climate model that did not resolve convection, coming into a neural network, one dimensional scalars across a few variables, a few other variables like solar insulation, how many watts of sunlight are coming in from the top of the planet, uh, and latent and surface sensible heat fluxes, how many, how much energy is coming in from the land surface. Then the response is what those interior physics are supposed to do, redistribute heat and moisture associated with clouds and convection. And so changes in heat, changes in moisture, also one dimensional profiles. And in training, we can simply expose a, a neural network to many millions of samples of the input and output pairs harvested from an actual numerical simulation that uses this multi-scale technique. And once trained, we can inference that trained model and replace it, replace the actual calculations that are quite expensive in the climate simulation with this trained neural network. <laughs> and so in 2017, we first asked with my colleague Pierre Gentin, whether this approach could work, whether we could use deep learning, dumb sheets of neurons to completely replace physics, uh, multi-scale models, explicit convection radiation calculations. And we started with uh, a idealized test bed. We removed the complexity of continents. We use a global aqua planet. We like to call it fictitious ocean world. And we were able to generate you know, 100 million input output pairs with no ambiguity, double precision pairs harvested from a year of a simulation that we harvested everything going into and out of each of 10,000 cloud resolving models and just asked if we could skillfully fit the input and output pairs by neural networks. And using rather crude neural networks, simple MLP models at the time. Um, and I'd like you to think of this as an MNIST for machine learning parameterization that that it sidesteps some challenging issues when you use other forms of training data. 
but contains many of the representative complexities of this sort of a problem. So the, the physics themselves are stochastic, they're not deterministic, they come from a chaotic physical system, um, but they're local and they're local by design. And yeah, so in the same sense that MNIST was very helpful, it seems like a boring task identifying digits, but it was quite helpful for getting to modern, practical, useful image recognition. So I, I like to think of machine learning of super parameterization in the same way. And at first I was very skeptical that this should work because of course, deep learning is just curve fitting and any curve fitting technique fails to extrapolate beyond the points it was trained on. And you should expect extrapolation issues to haunt you in climate simulation. But empirical results really began to change my views. This is the first one in 2018 that stuck with me. What you're looking at here is what we call a pressure latitude section. So pressure measures the vertical dimension in the atmosphere. And here's latitude from the South Pole to the North Pole. Looking at a summary of the error statistics of this fitting exercise. And where the blue colors exist is where the fit is pretty good. And as an atmospheric scientist, I'm attracted to the fact that these blue colors where the skill is emerging, you know, over 70% of variance explainable by a neural network, are in important regions of the atmosphere where I know that convective latent heating couples to the general circulation of the atmosphere. And so that was encouraging, but it's an offline exercise. Of course, the real challenge is to take these neural networks and actually put them inside a full-blown planetary climate simulator and ask what they do when they couple to real fluid dynamics. And lots of things can go wrong there, but this was the result that really stuck with me um, about a year later. What you're looking at here is a rich way to summarize the spatial temporal variability of the tropical atmosphere by doing two-dimensional Fourier spectra uh, in time to summarize how much of the variance is coming from different time scales, going from fast moving phenomena at the top to slow moving phenomena at the bottom and non-spatial scale on the x-axis here. So large things are near the middle and increasingly small things that move eastward to the right and westward to the left. And what you can see here in the baseline simulation on the left is a spectral feature of a few, few modes of tropical variability that couple tightly to convection that are familiar to tropical dynamicists. And the points at the middle panel looks a lot like the left panel, despite the fact that here we used tens of thousands of these pre-trained neural networks rather than actual physics calculations to couple to the climate ran for about a few years, harvested one of these spectra. And it's a nice integrative test that the way the atmosphere is moving uh, coupled to convective, uh, parameterized convection with neural networks looks rather realistic. Uh, the right hand panel just gives you for reference a, a separate simulation that represents convection in a different way. So, you know, that was the first result that stuck with me. This stuff can work sometimes. Um, and uh, another existential issue, of course, has been energy conservation. So data-driven methods don't obey conservation laws. Um, and I was reassured in 2018 by this next result by Tom Buchler that who wrote a nice paper defining an algorithm for how to just bake the conservation laws, in this case, conservation of column energy and vertically integrated um, moisture. Uh, convection can neither create nor destroy energy or moisture, it rather distributes it vertically. And so you can actually bake that rule into the deep learning architecture and deny the optimizer from ever choosing solutions that violate those constraints. And ironically, this had little effect on the optimization or skill landscape, but nonetheless, I think it's philosophically reassuring to those of us who might want to consider using deep learning methods to replace physics calculations in, in hybrid climate models. That was an important milestone. Okay, so that, that's sort of the end of the introduction to this frontier in my history with it. I wanted to spend some time elaborating on some current frontiers that I'm really interested in. And I'll, I'll mention three. Uh, the first it will be respecting stochasticity. And the second has to do with controlling instabilities and getting to more industrial scale problems. And the third has to do with moving beyond these fictitious ocean worlds, all places to plug in. So let me give you a tour of a paper um, that was championed by my collaborator, Veronica Ehring in Europe, along with Fiorentin and a great graduate student, Gunnar Behrens um, at, in, in Germany. So here we're going to replace the, the machine learning method that does this transformation of convectively unadjusted inputs like temperature and moisture profiles to convectively adjusted outputs like heating and moistening rates. Rather with an MLP model, we're going to build on something uh, that, that begins with a variational autoencoder. So let me just briefly explain what that means. This is a schematic of a variational autoencoder. Uh, on the left, it begins with Q theta, which is an encoder that, whose job is to map inputs to a latent vector. Uh, in the middle, the red dots are the latent vector, and those represent the parameters of, 
probability distribution functions rather than weights or biases of the MLP model. In training this sort of a thing, we have maximized an objective function that has a component highlighted here that encourages that encoder to make the inputs become Gaussian. Um, we express our, our prior through P of Z, in this case, a Gaussian. And this is helpful for disentangling the inputs in the latent space. So the inputs can be highly non-Gaussian, but you can encourage them through this transformation to become Gaussian in the interior. And then the decoder on the right, the P network, receives those latent samples and is encouraged to reconstruct the input and therefore not lose information about the input variables through this mapping. And of course, that's that's auto encoding, you know, X to X transformation. And that's not parameterization, which requires us to map X to Y convectively unadjusted to adjusted. So a small variation on the theme is to take a variational auto encoder, VAE, and turn it into a variational encoder decoder. Um, and that's what's illustrated here from Gunnar's paper. Um, so here you can see the inputs coming in on the left, um, temperatures, moistures, T's and Q's, incoming solar radiation, et cetera. And what's coming out on the right is not only those inputs, but also concatenated the outputs that we'd like to actually parameterize, the heating rates, the moistening rates, the precipitation associated with convection. Okay. And um, so, so that's a schematic of the architecture. You can read more about it in the paper, but here's the, the first result that I think is quite interesting, which is that compared to the baseline brute force neural network test in yellow here, so this is the error rate of the offline fit for the baseline, um, these VAEs are, are remarkably competitive, even if you use a very small latent space. So the input dimensionality here is on the order of 100 scalars, and we can boil that down to as little as five latent nodes in the interior without a large percentage increase in the, um, in the training skill. So that's quite interesting if you're interested in interpretability of what's going on under the hood of these machine learning methods because five is a, a human manageable number of things to peer at. And Gunnar has been great at peering at what's going on inside this latent space. This is one of the ways he likes to look at it, which is taking the first two PCAs of that five dimensional latent vector, and then plotting different physical properties of the convective samples, um, which you know, summarize rich variations of convective variability by geography, by latitude, by convective regime, by time of day. And, he's been able to find some fingerprints that show that this, this approach just learning to disentangle, to separate separable regimes of convection that are familiar to atmospheric dynamicists. So nighttime deep convection lives here on the latent space, tropical daytime convection lives over here, subtropical convection lives over here. And these are forms of convection that we in the domain know to have rather different vertical structures, different characteristic structures. And it's encouraging to see a method like this, learn to sort them into separate regions that can be separately analyzed. It's sort of a mode-specific machine learning. And yeah, I'll encourage you to have a look at that paper. The appendices have some lovely animations that, that look more at these latent properties. Uh, I think it's fascinating. And the reason I wanted to mention this is because it's a way to, be, to respect the stochasticity of this mapping, the chaotic nature of it. These methods can be generative in the sense that you can draw samples um, and, and generate many samples associated with a given input. And it's, it's helping us along the path of interpretability to understand how these methods are learning to parameterize convection. So I'd now like to move on to another theme I'm very interested in currently, which is exiting our infancy of sampling the uncertainties of machine learning. So a big problem I've noticed in the literature is that there are many competing claims about design choices that matter to your ultimate skill in this sort of a task. And very few, uh, you know, an unsatisfying amount of evidence to bolster those claims. And I want to mention an, another philosophical preference here, which is that um, this sort of parameterization attempts to do two forms of coarse graining in both space and time. So super parameterization embeds not only a high resolution spatial solution, but also a prognostic solution that involves in time with a nested time step. And there have been many issues trying to make this method, I showed one shiny result, but making reliably reproducible stable emulators um, is not something we know how to do yet. And so there's been one popular strategy, which is to strip that problem apart and make it less ambitious. Avoid coarse graining in time, which is very attractive because then you can begin to separate separable processes and apply separable constraints. 
you know, separately learn microphysics from turbulent diffusion. But, you know, those are elegant directions, but I'm, I wanted to express my interest is in, in leaning into the full complexity emulation problem, because that's where the, the full, the real transformative high performance computing benefits can come in when you also coarse grain in time. But the challenge there is that you're mixing processes, you're mixing the effects of microphysics and turbulent diffusion and radiation and everything that happens in these nested integrations. Um, and I think that complexity requires us to need to lean into uh, sampling and emulation at more industrial scales with large architecture searches and large amounts of uh, prognostic testing. So this is a figure I'm excited to share and it's work that I'm doing in collaboration with the, the LEAP Science and Technology Center at Columbia uh, through a graduate student at UCI, at UCI named Jerry Lynn. And what you're looking at here is the summary of thousands of prognostic tests, thousands of separate trials of running a climate model with a candidate neural network architecture. And I wanna illustrate the problem first in blue, which is something that I mentioned before, reliable, reproducible um, skill is not here yet. The, the baseline is the black line. That's the error rate we would like to see uh, that ref 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 reflects the internal variability of the zonal mean temperature field. And what you see in the blue lines are what tends to happen frequently when you plug one of these neural network emulators is that, that you, you get massive error rates. You know, this is a log scale, so 10 to 100 Kelvin root mean squared error in the zonal mean climate. Um, and these, you know, this frequently causes the climate model to crash, and it's definitely drifting to unrealistic attractors. Now, there have been several claims in the literature about how to control this problem. One of them that I've been involved in has to do with uh, avoiding out of sample inputs by recasting the moisture variable in the blue family here, which is written in specific humidity, rather in terms of relative humidity. So relative humidity is a way to measure moisture that's bounded by the value zero and just over 100 in any climate. And so it's less prone to extrapolation error. Um, and you can see here, um, Jerry has taken the time to fit thousands of separate neural network architectures that made this specific humidity design choice and thousands more that made the relative humidity design choice in order to do hundreds of tests of each and ask himself if the PDFs of the prognostic error separate. And I hope you can agree that the red family of curves is separably lower than the blue family of curves. And so this is the sort of statistical sampling that can convince us at an industrial scale which design choices actually matter. And you know the ones I'd like to highlight in this plot beyond the relative humidity decision, which relates to climate invariance, um, is also the yellow curve here. So the family of curves that's closest to this baseline floor of internal variability that we're competing to, to strive towards is one that, that includes not only relative humidity on the input, but also information about previous time tendencies in the input vector. And so a notion of convective memory. Um, so, so I think this is the beginning of our seeing pipelines that can do the sort of automated end-to-end -end, um, sampling of the halo of architecture uncertainty that surrounds any given design choice. And I'm really hopeful that we'll begin to learn more about what really matters to get reliable reproducible skill and avoid these frequent situations that blow up and uh, have to rely less on luck in finding skillful uh, configurations that produce attractive equatorial wave spectra, et cetera. And so the other aspect of exiting our infancy in this field that I want to mention is moving beyond aquaplanets. So all of the work I've showed you up to date has avoided the complexity of continents because we've poked at it and know that it's even more challenging than the aquaplanet. But I think the aquaplanet is just on the verge of becoming too easy, which is wonderful news. And therefore, I wanted to announce that we're developing a new real geography data set. And this is being done in close coordination with developers of a, a modern multi-scale modeling code at the Department of Energy. So there's uh, only one major agency, climate modeling agency, that has invested heavily in, uh, in supporting the software infrastructure of a modern MMF, but the DOE is one of them. And in this time, we're taking care to track absolutely everything, you know, according to the code designers themselves, that comes into and out of the kernel of super parameterization. So it's easy to miss things. These are massive codes, millions of lines long, and uh, you want to really work with the developers to make sure that you're being causatively complete in all the possible inputs and outputs that may matter. Um, so I'm excited that that data set has is, is been generated, and we're working towards making a a competition around it and some nice documentation and also some prognostic testing workflows so people can compete around the error that matters 
to prognostic error when candidate architectures are embedded in a hybrid code. So anyway, I just want to advertise this in case any of you are interested in getting involved in beta testing this. We're looking for early users and please contact me if you'd like. So that the great challenge here is can we learn how to do this reproducibly reliably in operationally complex settings that include continents and everything that matters for real world climate prediction. So speaking of things that matter for real world climate prediction, I mentioned low clouds in the beginning of this talk. I want to talk about the outlook for these multi-scale climate models to capture low clouds, because this approach is undergoing a bit of a renaissance. Part of that renaissance is coming from just the possibilities of GPU supercomputing. Um, climate models have been difficult to port to new architectures because there are many millions of lines of code. Uh, but multi-scale climate models are unique because 90% of the calculations are done by less than 5% of the code, the small region that handles the interior scale. And thus, it was an early target even seven years ago for GPU code porting. And that's, that's succeeded, and now we can be 100 times more ambitious um, in the computational intensity, so it's quite exciting. And alongside these computational advances, there have been algorithmic advances in understanding how to regionalize very high resolution configurations of the interior resolve scale where we know it matters in the subtropical latitudes where the low clouds tend to live. And so this is a study you can read about where we were expecting trouble when we did this, when you introduced grid discrepancies at prescribed boundaries, but it turns out that trouble was less than expected. So as long as you take care to load balance the intense workload, this can yield additional factors of two, three, four on top of the 100 from GPU computing. And then finally, we're learning how to control, how to actually generate healthy amounts of strata cumulus cloud in these models. Um, there's been a longstanding problem with multi-scale models that they haven't been able to produce enough low cloud, um, but we've tested some methods inspired from the large eddy simulation community about how to compensate for deficiencies of the momentum solver and the microphysics scheme that are producing encouraging results. This is the main result here. This green blob indicates that we're finally seeing some healthy amounts of low level liquid at subtropical latitudes. And in, the, in association with that, when we do warming experiments, heating up the surface, we're seeing some robust low cloud responses in the vicinity of these robust low clouds. And so you can read more about that in this paper as well. But it's all just to say that I think that as we look forward to the really existential challenges of things like low cloud systems, multi-scale models are going to be increasingly helpful for providing training data that can um, actually contain a notion of the explicit physics that lead to those clouds. And the question is, will we be able to train skillful emulators as we, as we have in coarser resolution limits that I've shown you for these next generation multi-scale climate uh, prediction training data sets? And it's worth finding out because I mentioned we have this computational problem. We have no conceivable way of getting to sub-kilometer resolutions by 2060, but machine learning could be one. Can we use ML through these hybrid parameterization approaches to sneak sub-kilometer physics into climate models decades ahead of computational schedule? It really matters to find out, to confront the low cloud problem, better assess its future hazard, better assess our kids' hazard. And again, I want you to think of MMF test bids as really like an MNIST for, for machine learning parameterization. They draw a lot of idealizations, like limiting our attention to digits rather than real interesting things and images um, of dimensionality, but they contain a lot of representative challenges, the challenges of chaos, of stochasticity, of multimodality. Uh, um, and, and if you peer at their interior physics, you'll convince yourself there's a lot of realistic aspects of convection going on despite those idealizations that are, are good to focus on while shielding yourself from even harder challenges about non-locality. Okay, so I wanted to switch gears now from this topic of hybrid-based um, machine learning parameterization and multi-scale climate models to something that's been totally new to me the past year associated with my adventures with NVIDIA. Um, so let's switch from climate to weather prediction. Some context here is that the CEO of NVIDIA about a year ago, and you can read this blog post, expressed an interest and passion for the company doing climate work. Of course, it's been doing climate work for a long time, both through building supercomputers that climate modeling centers use and actually participating in proving the potential speed of light configuration of kernels that are in climate models if they're actually ported to the potential of modern architectures, you know, through CUDA, et cetera. Um, but, but he's expressed interest in, in contributing on the AI realm, on achieving um, a, a, you know, resolution that seems inconceivable today, and on improving the utility of climate predictions for stakeholders. 
So I didn't know a lot about NVIDIA other than I really enjoyed their GPU supercomputers through the DOE, uh, but I've come to appreciate that it's a, a fascinating company um, with unbelievable talent. It's 25,000 employees, people who innovate new AI algorithms, the sorts of people I've never met, like deep learning engineers who know how to optimize ambitious machine learning workflows uh, as teams in many disciplinary settings. There's people who build supercomputers, who tune code for them, <clears throat> just fascinating. And the business model permits a lot of open science collaboration. collaboration. <clears throat> so the Earth2 initiative at, at NVIDIA has been influenced heavily by this group of people, EU climate scientists involved in Destination Earth, um, who've uh, communicated with Jensen. And the applied mission of Destiny, Destination Earth, is also a part of Earth2's applied mission. I was lucky to join as a director this summer after consulting for a quarter in the spring. And this is my team, J.D. Pathak. I'll show you some of his results on weather prediction. Noah Brenowitz, who joined us from the Allen Institute for AI, um, that, that led by Chris Bretherton, and Yair Cohen, who joined us from another frontier climate model, contributing to the developments of NVIDIA for a long time. <clears throat> and I want to tell you about the explosion in data-driven weather prediction that's going on. So the context, for those of you not in the business, uh, is classical numerical weather prediction, which means solving F equals MA for an incompressible fluid on a rotating sphere. There's a difficult problem of estimating initial conditions and then producing ensemble forecasts of the future with a halo of uncertainty. And it's very compute intensive. It takes a lot of compute to calculate each of these trajectories as a physically deterministic calculation, high resolution calculations requiring short time steps and uh, therefore the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting has big supercomputers. There's a modern alternative that's interestingly complementary, which is fully data-driven weather prediction. And it's like training machine learning to make 1080p video, uh, but instead of having only three channels, you have many more channels associated with different variables and altitudes of the atmosphere, temperature maps at the surface, temperature maps at the mid troposphere. But just like you can train ML to hallucinate video autoregressively, you can also attempt to train pure ML, not hybrid ML, to roll out weather predictions. There's a challenge is that you don't have the whole internet's worth of YouTube to give you unlimited training samples because we're limited by the length of the satellite record. That's about 15,000 days of samples or maybe a factor of 10 more since we have several samples a day. Um, but it's, it's becoming evident that these sorts of systems can be stood up by relatively small teams within tech companies and they're producing skill gains rapidly. And I think they're very interesting to contemplate. Here's a brief history of the, the ambition of resolution of these sorts of approaches, going back to five years ago or so with Dubin and Bauer, where there is six degree nominal resolution and simple MLP models progressing through lots of players now. Um, ForecastNet, one of their claim to fame, NVIDIA's uh, data-driven weather prediction model, was the first to, to lean into the challenge of a fully quarter degree resolution, so the native resolution of the era five reanalysis data set that it's trained on. Um, <clears throat> Of course, that's not, there's a few others working at that level of ambition these days. The typical data ingested of the available hundreds of terabytes is on the order of tens. And the autoregressive time interval, which can be varied, is normally selected at about six hours. And one has to decide which variables to choose from the archive of those available. We tend to choose temperatures, winds, geopotentials, and humidities at as many as five to 15 vertical levels alongside column water vapor and surface pressure. And the goal is simply to, to use a machine learning method to take the inputs at time k and predict the same variables at time k plus one. And we have a two-stage process where we also do a secondary fine tuning that after we train a model on time k plus one, we also expose it to information about k plus two, and that tends to produce some improvements in the skill as well. You can read about the details in this preprint on archive by J.D. Pathak. The architecture is inspired by uh, modern vision transformers, um, which use a patch or a position embedding to produce a latent representation of a tiled version of the input. So the effective resolution is lower than quarter degree in the sense that there's a patching on the order of four to eight, four to four by four to eight by eight. But then it's attention and channel mixing that is providing the machine learning here. And uh, importantly, in our case, the spatial mixing is done in the Fourier domain. So uh, Fourier neural operators are used for the global convolution uh, by transforming into Fourier space and allowing channel mi mixing to happen in that dimension. Uh, that's efficient, and um, but it doesn't do some inductive biases about periodicity in the plane. 
Um, but the goal is to learn mesh independent solution operators. Um, the A in AFNO is about efficiency and uh, there's uh, aspects of efficient token mixing and, and diagonal channel mixing that, that allow efficient methods of this approach um, that, that we build on as well. Okay, but here's the point. It's a fully, this is a picture from the weather simulation um, of forecast net, fully global weather simulation. Once it's trained, um, you can, it inferences blazing fast. You can get a two week forecast in a quarter second. And that's a speed up of 10,000 to 100,000 compared to deterministic prediction. And that's quite, quite interesting. We'll get into the implications there. What I want to highlight is the dizzying change in the increase in the skill of these methods. Okay, so this is just one small team within one company tinkering, um, you know, uh, over about the course of a year. In the yellow here is the benchmark score of the IFS, the Integrated Forecasting System Gold Standard De Deterministic Forecasting System. So higher is better. Skill drops off with lead time in a in a chaotic system, as you can expect, as memory of the initial condition disappears. And the rate of that drop off is what you're competing against. You know, about a year ago, we were here in the purple line. And, you know, not long afterwards, we're here in the blue line. So you can see the sort of steady march of skill increases. Some of the things that mattered were adding more information about the upper atmosphere, also the number of transformer blocks and the hidden dimension of the architecture matter. Although, of course, there's caveats there because those trade off with inference speed and training cost and memory use and your ability to explore ablations that matter. This is a big open question about what the most efficient route to improving data-driven weather prediction accuracy is right now. We should contrast these rates of skill increase against the historical improvements in weather prediction, which have been much slower to achieve, but very steady and impressive. And of course, those advances are the foundation for what these machine learning models are, are able to exploit uh, in the sense that they learn from the assimilated state estimates of those conventional forecasting systems. But I think the pace and people, number of people involved uh, are, are remarkably faster um, in the purely machine learning era. It's fascinating. There's been an open question about whether these systems trained on reanalysis can be used for real-time prediction, which is where they have utility. Um, and uh, so here was an attempt to take our model that was trained on a reanalysis and expose it to initial conditions that are available closer to real time from a separate data simulation system in the United States. And the point is that the um, that, that the purple line is not too far from the yellow line. There's some loss in the lower quartile of skill, but pretty reassuring zero shot skill transfer. Um, and so lots of potential for real time forecasting here. And there's been an explosion of activity in this space from other industry players as well. So this is a, an important paper that was put out in November 22 by Huawei. They use a different approach involving four dimensional transformers that are exposed to both spatial and temporal information about uh, th three dimensions in space and, and a further dimension in time as the basis of their transformer blocks, but otherwise dealing with similar input data. And they have some remarkable claims about better than state of the art skill. Uh, here you're looking at a, a measure of tropical, tra uh, tropical cyclone track error uh, that's claiming to be considerably better than the ECMWF's um, high resolution ensemble. And so that's quite a claim. Uh, of course, unfortunately, this claim's not verifiable yet. This model's not open source, but it's a very interesting claim. You might have also heard um, a month later that DeepMind put out a paper called GraphCast, which is very interesting as well. It uses a completely different architecture, a graph neural network, a, a hierarchical icosahedral grid, uh, but similar training data and an interesting training curriculum that increases uh, the multi-step rollout, not just from one to two steps, but all the way to 12 steps to learn long, long range time dependencies. And, and this paper has very impressive uh, skill claims relative to the same scoreboard that the European Center uses to evaluate its own internal model developments. And so each blue dot here indicates for a separate variable at a separate altitude of the atmosphere, whether there's been a skill increase in blue relative to a decrease in red. And they're claiming rather remarkable skill increases across many variables and lead times relative to the gold standard. And, and they published this interesting ablation as well that shows that as you expand the autoregressive time window in these methods, then you can see some monotonic uh, improvements in the error rates. And so certainly the, the time window matters. So I want to emphasize that unlike these others, you can, you can download NVIDIA's version of a fully data-driven pipeline. Uh, for weather forecasting and play with it. Um, here's the link. We've we've recently updated it to include the 26 variable version that I mentioned, the blue line compared to the purple line. 
and including the GFS um, ability to launch near real time weather forecasts. And I want to mention this because there's so many exciting research questions here. So the dawn of a completely new way to simulate the global atmosphere. Um, I'm curious about what's the physical essence of the current attention-based learning. There's interpretability games to play there. What are the constraints on the time steps and hidden dynamics? It should be audacious that models like these can generate their own tropical cyclones despite having a six-hour time step. It's completely different than classical fluid dynamics. So clearly some sort of hidden dynamics are being learned. And what are those? Uh, there's open questions about the realism of the generated chaotic trajectory divergence. Um, there's questions about the maximum theoretical rollout time scale, whether these models exhibit responses to external forcing that we think indicate they've learned a degree of physics, and a huge question about whether they could eventually evolve to become atmospheric components trustworthy enough to replace those in Earth system models. <clears throat> So part of that is spread and chaotic trajectory divergence. And um, maybe I'll skip some of this, but point you to a preprint if you're interested in learning about that. Um, but just to move on to the point, I think the biggest point, which is that speed changes everything. For the history of weather forecasting, there's been a tension between the resolution of a forecast and the number of ensemble members that you can simulate. They're subject to the same context computational constraint, but that's vanished now. Once you pre-train one of these ML autoregressive models, they're trivial to inference. So you can start to imagine 10,000 member ensembles or major savings in energy. And it's just, it's fascinating to think of the possibilities. One possibility beyond weather that NVIDIA has been thinking about for taking this uh, capability and doing something helpful for climate is simply as a way to interpolate between checkpoints and high resolution climate simulations. So. High resolution climate simulation faces a storage and latency dilemma in that if you want to save all the information of most utility to stakeholders that occurs at high spatial at high spatial resolution and, and uh, high time frequency, it's too much storage and storage is expensive, you know, on the order of an exabyte to save everything. Uh, but it may be possible to instead pre-train these generative machine learning models that can interpolate between or generate between checkpoints that are much easier to store and nonetheless provide the details of the extremes and the probability distribution of the extremes in the future climate that we must plan around. So that's one stepping stone from this weather capability to climate that we're considering. <clears throat> but I know I'm running out of time and Phil asked me to try to limit myself to 40 minutes. I'm sorry, I'm going five minutes over here, but uh, I just wanna emphasize machine learning is completely upending computational trade-offs in our field. It's a very exciting time. Um, in hybrid climate simulation, where we use machine learning as a subunit, that interacts with the broader simulation of planetary fluid dynamics. I, I hope I've convinced you that multi-scale modeling frameworks are a helpful analog to MNIST um, and that there's exciting techniques like using variational encoder decoders these days to, to deal with the stochasticity and the interpretability. I haven't mentioned causal pruning, but that's another area to be following where there are formal methods using the causal inference machinery to, to avoid the pitfall of spurious connections being learned. And then I want to emphasize this issue of, of challenging ourselves to build fully industrial pipelines for sufficient sampling to put to rest the debates about what really matters on the design end to get reliable, reproducible emulation to succeed. And at this stage, I'm convinced that climate invariant moisture variables matter on the input and convective memory matters, but I'm, I, I don't know what else we need to learn there. Um, yeah, I want to re remind you that there's an exciting new benchmark data set emerging and let me know if you want to play with it and remind you that, that high resolution MMFs are emerging as well that have increasingly good looking low clouds in them to learn from. Of course, it's only MNIST, right? The point of MNIST is to succeed on a boring problem so you can do the more important ones. And just to paint the picture of that, you know, if we could succeed in doing this for super parameterization, the goal would be to learn, say, the perimeter of an actual region of geographically complex stratocumulus clouds. Um, and there are ways to build regionally refined modeling simulations that have such perimeters that I think would be a worthy challenge once we can deal with the first one. And it's not the only system of nested complexity that matters in the climate. Low clouds are one of many. There's phytoplankton communities, detailed interactions between ocean turbulence and biota that impact the Earth's carbon absorptivity through the biological pump. There's ice sheet outflow zones and details of how Glaciers flow over subgrid topography features that impact the rate of sea level rise that are versions of nested complexity that seem computational, computationally formidable, but might benefit from machine learning approaches that are similar. There's water catchments and managing infrastructure impacts at the unresolved estuaries where people live. <clears throat> 
And on the fully data-driven modeling side, I think it's just very exciting times and the world is wondering and amazed by the, the speed up potential and the skill potential of these fully data-driven weather prediction systems. And um, if you're interested in learning more about NVIDIA's plans there, feel free to check out our industry uh, talks at the GTC conference, they're archived from fall. But the point is there's new tools, new possibilities, so many going on within tech companies. And I, I'm convinced from this brief adventure with industry that there are complementary tool sets on the industry and academic side and that they'll be strongest when working together. I sense conditions for that to happen. And uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that NVIDIA has a lot of technologies that students can take advantage to explore digital twins. Um, there's a lot of experience and products that have been built for digital twins of infrastructure and, and design, um, uh, design professionals that I think haven't been exploited yet for climate simulation. So thanks so much for your time. Thanks for inviting me. I look forward to your questions in the discussion. And uh, yeah. Thanks, Mike. This was a really fantastic talk. Uh, so much to unpick, really. So much interesting uh, science going on and so much to, to follow up on. So just a reminder to the audience, uh, you can um, put questions in the, it's called video wall. So it doesn't say chat, it's called video wall, but you can put it in, in the neural network. And there's already a question from, from Peter Watson. Unfortunately, they can't speak up themselves, so I'll regurgitate the question. So Peter asks, the weather prediction results uh, seem very exciting. Uh, though you said earlier, we should be skeptical when uh, machine learning models go outside of training. And numerical weather prediction models need to work reliably in these situations. So are you doing anything to test if your model work well in unprecedented extreme events? Oh, I situation? would love to do that together. Yeah, I have a big open question in my mind. I don't think we know what the extrapolation boundary of these fully data-driven weather prediction systems is. It's a wonderful student project, a wonderful project to collaborate on. Um, yeah, yeah, it's on my mind. <laughs> the most I've done, Peter, is to try to hit it with a gill forcing and see if I can get a gill type response on the equator. Uh, but we haven't stretched it to the limit. Where does it break? We need to understand where that is. I think a fruitful thing to do in this regard could be to train only on El Nino and test on and on uh, uh, the other phase of El Nino. Understand if you could get the extreme weather to climate relationship. Um, if the extrapolation boundary in is inclusive to that, that would be very exciting for the potential to, to look slightly beyond the boundaries of the observed record. But right now it's unclear. Very interesting question. Excellent. Then there's another question from, from Björn uh, Lütjens, uh, who asks, uh, what are the pros and cons for using machine learning to learn non-local parameterization instead of local parameterizations? Hmm. Yeah, so in super parameterization, I know it's local because of the way it's formulated. And so I might have thought that there's no benefit to going non-local, but actually I think there is because you have spatial context to rely on, which may actually help the machine learning. Um, and so, yeah, spatial context is definitely something that's been proven to be important in image recognition. Uh, of course, when you're dealing with something more sophisticated than superparameterization, like learning something from an actual global cloud resolving model where there's purely non-local physics, gravity waves can escape radially, uh, they're not trapped to be locally periodic, then I think the question of what the appropriate non-locality is is a really rich one, and machine learning parameterization affords a way to sort of understand whether the traditional assumptions we've made about locality and convection parameterization have been appropriate or where, where the appropriate boundary is. So that that's like a, a 30 minute conversation, Bjorn, but thanks. Yeah. We can continue offering later in the chat afterwards, but uh, there's a question from Bertrand, Denis. Uh, how does it, and that's a good one, how does the traditional research community and, and weather prediction community is reacting to these results? So. Uh, is it causing tensions? Is it creating good discussions? So what's your experience so far? I, I sense great discussions, at least through my NVIDIA interactions. I don't know how much I should divulge about those, but yeah, I sense real authentic interest and um, and, and willingness to, to have dialogue. I think um, we at NVIDIA are just really motivated to put things out in the open source and hope people look at them. I'm really, I'm really hopeful that card-carrying meteorologists look skeptically at these forecasts and and that we can work together to understand the pathologies of the current versions and uh, you know, as rapidly as possible access the potential to democratize weather prediction. But of course it's very disruptive too, right? So I don't know how they're thinking about it, um, but I, I think it's here to stay. I don't see it stopping. Um, and the question is whether it happens behind closed doors in tech companies or in close partnership with the agencies that develop the training data that's fueling it all. Um, I hope it's the latter. Uh, a follow up maybe with a direct question on this a little bit. Uh, it, so 
Our current models are imperfect. And even if we push to kilometer scale, and there are huge uncertainties in microphysics and other bits, which we haven't even discovered yet because it's just so new. So in a way, building surrogate models nicely mirrors the imperfections. Uh, so how do you see the field evolving in that regard? Or how can, maybe one question is, how do surrogate models become actually better than the models that they're trying to predict rather than faster? And how can we really, um, do, or how can we actually unpick some of this if we do this full model ev uh, emulation? Because you basically make it much harder to do explainable AI and really see where it's coming from. Oh, I mean, those are tough questions, Phil. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I do think the speed could help with the fact that we feel limited in our ability to sample structural and parametric error when we want to do high resolution simulation. If we believe that updraft spectrum we can rely on better resolved neighbor Stokes is important to the microphysical interactions that we want to constrain, then then having a way to reliably inference, you know, 10,000 members in a tuning campaign that that is trained on the conditional, you know, the, the conditional emergent behavior of the turbulence coupled to varying plausible implementations of the microphysics and holding that whole system accountable to satellite constraints is an exciting path or just a way to exploit the speed. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I'm aware of more sophisticated approaches through LEAP that could be explicitly based in, in the way that they attempt to generalize the microphysical relationships. I think that's a very interesting field. Um, yeah. But you, you raised a lot of, of issues there, Phil. That, that's like a, an hour long conversation as well. I, I think I forgot one of them, but. No, that, that's totally fine. There's also more, more questions. So um, there's a question, um, but I mm. roughly know the answer. There was a question for, from Yuri. Uh, why climate climate X wasn't listed as an alternative? Do you have any thought oh, yeah. about that? Yeah, nothing intentional in that omission. It's a relatively new paper. You know, I guess it it, it hasn't convinced me that it's got state of the art weather prediction skill. Um, but I think what they've done that's quite interesting. Sorry, can you still hear me, Phil? You're frozen. Yep, all good. Hello. Hi. I think we lost you for a moment, but I could hear you all well. But I think your sound might be gone. Uh, Philip, you're fine. I think we have an issue with Mike's connection. Okay, so we just couldn't figure it out if it's Mike or me, but I think we lost Mike for a minute. So mm -hmm. let's hope he's coming back. If he's not coming back in the next few seconds, then I think we will resume this in the chat. So I can already say, for, for those of you new here, I'm still learning it myself. So you can continue networking and discussions in the neural network where you can chat to people. And that's where we will direct people. But I think we have lost mic for now i'll give it give him another 10 or 20 seconds and otherwise i think we had a really good discussion already and we move to the chat so my impression is and and the ITU team can correct me, but I think probably the best is uh, to move to the neural network for those of you who are still here and want to have further discussions. Um, you can go in there, talk to people, and I hope we will see Mike there very shortly as well. So with that, I'd like to thank you already uh, for joining. Uh, join every week, but in particular every two weeks when we have a climate science talk, and you can find a very nice program already online. And I hope uh, we see you also back in two weeks and see some of you in the neural network. Thank you very much. And I think I'm handing back to Anna if I'm correct. That's correct. Thanks a lot, Phil. Thank you for participating in today's AI for Good session. We hope you've learned something new, innovative, and engaging in today's event. We now encourage you to continue the conversation on the live video wall in the neural network. Here you can ask questions. Like and comment, share links, complete the poll, connect with interesting profiles, or speak one-on-one -on -one using the chat and video function. We invite you to explore the lobby, 
Try the smart matching quiz, visit the virtual exhibits, poster boards, the eShop, and build your personalized AI for good program. Let's shape the future of AI for good. AI is a powerful tool. This summit can help ensure that artificial intelligence charts a course that benefits humanity and bolsters our shared values.